Over on the bright Elysian shore, where the holly tempest comes no more, I'll meet you by the river. Meet you by the river. Some sweet day. Some happy day. Far beyond the partings and the tomb, where the charming roses ever bloom, I'll meet you by the river. Handsomely framed by massive limestone bluffs and forested slopes. Lake Pepin is a particularly beautiful stretch of water on the upper Mississippi River. Those viewing Pepin's waters, American Indians who first knew its shores, the French who provided its name to the Americans who followed, have told of its allure. The area enthralled William Cullen Bryant, the great 19th century American poet and newspaper editor, who declared it ought to be visited in the summer by every painter and poet in the land. Lake Pepin is actually a widening of the Mississippi River. Wisconsin's Chippewa River carries sediment into the Mississippi, northwest of Wabashaw, Minnesota, slowing the river's flow and backing up its waters for 21 miles. This portion of the Great River stretches from south of Red Wing to about 10 miles past Lake City. This beautiful body of water can also be treacherous, particularly when summer storms rumble across it. On July 13, 1890, a massive weather system muscled its way into eastern Minnesota. It skirted downtown St. Paul before spawning a 5 p.m. tornado that tore into Little Canada and Lake Jarvis, killing six and injuring 11. A St. Paul photographer placed his camera on Cherokee Heights and recorded the tornado's approach. Images of the tornado's deadly visit to St. Paul are preserved in this remarkable photographic record. The slow-moving storm front that produced the Lake Jarvis tornado continued to build. Three hours later, it would strike Lake Pepin and deliver a frightful blow to the steamer Sea Wing and its 215 passengers. Heavy winds capsized the overloaded paddle wheeler and 98 people died. The three-year-old steamer Sea Wing had the look of a late 19th century Mississippi River workboat. It was built for business, no frills except for a little gingerbreading on the pilot house. The ship weighed about 109 tons and was 135 feet long. Its height of 22 feet made the steamboat six feet higher than it was wide. The boat was based on the Wisconsin side of the Mississippi in Diamond Bluff about six miles northwest of Red Wing. David Niles Weathern, shown here, and his partner Mel Sparks, residents of Diamond Bluff, used the Sea Wing mainly as a log rafter, towing timber downriver for processing. Weathern and Sparks also made extra cash by hosting excursions on the Sea Wing, taking advantage of special events and summer weather to entice passengers into cooling river trips. When the Sea Wing owners announced a Sunday trip downriver to Lake City and the Minnesota National Guard encampment there, interest among potential excursionists soared. 18-year-old Mary Leach and her friend Minnie Fisher, shown here, were among a group of students from Red Wing's Magnuson School of Sewing who paid the 50-cent fare and were aboard. To attract more interest in the excursion, the Sea Wing's owners announced they would attach a covered barge to their vessel. That barge, known as the Jim Grant, would feature Henry Raider's four-piece band. Mary Leach called the trip the event of the season. With 10 crewmen and 11 passengers on board, Captain Weathern eased the Sea Wing and its attached barge out of Diamond Bluff at 8.40 the morning of July 13, 1890. Weathern and his wife Nellie brought along their two young sons, Roy, 10 years old, and Pearlie, 8. Another 10 excursionists, all in their teens or 20s, embarked at nearby Trenton, Wisconsin. 
and the vessel headed to Red Wing, a prosperous Minnesota river town of 6,000 people. About 170 passengers, many carrying picnic lunches, awaited the steamer at Red Wing's levee. Weathern's customers looked forward to seeing Red Wing's National Guard Company G in training at Camp Lakeview. The camp was just south of downtown Lake City. They also hoped a river cruise would provide a break from the oppressively hot, humid weather that had plagued the region for a week. Some parents took children on the voyage, making the event a family occasion. Red Wing saloon owner Peter Gherkin and his wife Maria led all five of their children onto the vessel. John and Kate Scheffler brought their sons, John Jr. and Frederick, with them. It came as no surprise that males outnumbered females on the ship three to one. In 1890s America, women required proper escorts for such an outing. Thus, husbands, fiancés, and relatives accompanied most of the 57 women and girls aboard the Sea Wing. Female passengers included the Steiger sisters, Annie and Frances, who embarked with their dates from Minneapolis, and Anna and Julia Persig, sisters from a Hay Creek farm south of Red Wing, along with two male escorts. Mary Skogland, a 17-year-old from Red Wing, and Eliza Crawford, a young schoolteacher from the Kenyon area southwest of Red Wing, both traveled with groups of friends. Pleasant morning breezes and calm waters made for smooth sailing as the Sea Wing passed Red Wing's Barn Bluff, heading for Lake City. The Sea Wing reached Lake City's Washington Street landing shortly before noon. Captain Weatherin originally planned to depart town at 6 o'clock, but partner Mel Sparks announced the steamer would stay until the military activities had been concluded. Once ashore, the visitors boarded horse-drawn carriages or strolled to the National Guard's summer training ground, Camp Lakeview. Locals joined them. As promised, members of the Guard's 1st Regiment held military demonstrations that entertained and educated their Sunday guests. Storm clouds began building in the late afternoon, but Guardsmen continued with their program. Around 6 o'clock, sudden and violent wind gusts punished the area, scattering the Camp Lakeview crowd. When the tempest subsided, David Weathern believed the worst of the weather system had passed. The Sea Wing captain blew the ship whistle to recall his passengers. Those heading back to the riverboat found a chaotic scene at the Lake City landing. Passengers scurried onto the ship, while many others dithered. Had the storm passed? Was it safe to go out on the water? Most decided to get on board. Captain Weathern would later report he had just under 175 passengers on the Sea Wing and the barge Jim Grant as it left Lake City. Weathern's wife Nellie had put their young son Pearlie to bed in the captain's cabin and calmly sat in a rocking chair outside its door. Not all of Weathern's customers were on the vessel. Some had missed the ship's whistle and were unaware of its departure. Mary Leach and most of her sewing school group were still at Camp Lakeview after taking shelter in a tent. A few excursionists decided against making the return trip. Casper Cap Haustein of Red Wing also lingered at Camp Lakeview, joining some friends and sharing beer provided by guardsmen. The group then boarded a carriage and returned to the Lake City dock. As he rode along, Haustein eyed the approach of dark black clouds, so low, he said, you would think they'd touch your head. Arriving at the dock, Cap Haustein spied the sea wing already on the lake. He grabbed a carriage lantern and tried signaling the captain to return for him and the other passengers. But the vessel continued to steam north through heavy waves. Captain Weathern's patrons on the sea wing took note of the threatening skies. One excursionist, Lake City resident Charlie Seawall, sized up the situation and sensed danger looming. 
He stood up, yelled, Goodbye, boys, then jumped off the barge and swam ashore. Just minutes away from the Sea Wing, a powerful frontal thunderstorm system plowed through Red Wing, causing heavy damage in and around the town. Strong blasts of wind struck Lake City and Lake Pepin almost simultaneously. Flying tents filled the air at Camp Lakeview. The storm tore up Lake City. Collins Brothers' planing mill, Hanish Academy of Music, and Young & Company's dry goods buildings were nearly demolished. Some 30 structures suffered damage. A group of 1st Regiment officers sat in inky darkness inside the hospital tent at Camp Lakeview as the weather system approached. A regimental history recorded what happened next. Gusts of wind howled down the ravine between the high bluffs south of Camp Lakeview. Then for a moment, all was still as death. Men rushed from their tents with axes and hatchets to drive in their tent pins. In less than one minute, the cyclone struck us with all its terrific force. The hospital tent went up like a balloon and then came down on its occupants like a big wet cloth that it was. The air was filled with flying tent poles, tent pins, fence boards, and everything movable moved. Not a light was burning in the camp, and between the flashes of lightning, the angry waves of Lake Pepin could be seen rolling mountain high. Out on the water, Captain Weathern steered the sea wing close to the Wisconsin shore toward the famous limestone formation known as Maiden Rock. He could see the storm front advancing toward him from the Minnesota side of Lake Pepin. Weathern turned the riverboat into the wind. Excursionists also eyed the approach of the storm. Word spread that the captain had ordered women and children inside the ship's cabin. Many, trying to avoid the wind and rain, had already moved there. Others, fearing the top-heavy sea wing was more dangerous in wind, hopped from the boat onto the barge Jim Grant. The attached barge offered some stability to the flat-bottom sea wing, now rolling back and forth in heavy waves. The ships disturbingly swayed from side to side with strong tugs from the barge ropes cutting short the movement. These jolts grew more violent as the winds increased in force. Some passengers strapped on the cork or bulrush life preservers. Prayers were heard. Confusion and panic grew among the passengers. Was the barge hindering Weathering's ability to navigate, or would it help keep the sea wing afloat? Should the barge be cut free? Powerful wave action answered such questions, breaking the Jim Grant loose. The sea wing lurched to starboard, exposing a portion of the steamer's bottom. Then, as those on the barge looked on in horror, the sea wing tipped to a 45 degree angle, balanced for an instant, and rolled over. Lightning illuminated a nightmarish scene on Lake Pepin as wind, rain, and hailstones, some the size of hen's eggs, pelted those in the water struggling to survive. A few, including Captain Weathern, managed to get onto the steamboat's slippery bottom. Trapped in the pilot house when his ship rolled, Weathern escaped and reached the surface. He shouted questions about the fate of his wife and two children. No one had seen them. Scattered groups of survivors floated on wreckage. River currents carried some to safety, others to their death. A handful of strong swimmers made for land those on the crowded barge, nearly all men, were the safest. Although the ongoing tempest gave them a rough ride, the waves were diminishing. They could see that the Jim Grant was drifting toward shore. About 80 passengers on the barge would soon be safe. There would be no escape for passengers who had packed themselves into the Sea Wing's main cabin. As the steamboat rolled, they found themselves thrust upside down, shoulder to shoulder, under Lake Pepin's roiling waters. They were beyond help. Currents slowly pushed the overturned ship and its ghastly cargo downstream. The situation then worsened for those perched on the ship's bottom. 
as the vessel reached the shallows around Central Point, its superstructure struck the lake bed. The steamer rolled on to its side, tossing those clinging to the wreck back into the water, adding more to the growing death toll. As the Jim Grant drifted towards land, a few young men, including Lake City and Harry Maybe, jumped from the barge, waded ashore, and ran toward Lake City for help. Maybe reached the village fire hall and rang its bell. Word of Sea Wing's fate spread quickly. Townspeople, just beginning to recover from the storm that had ravaged their community, raced to Oscar Peterson's boatyard to organize rescue efforts. B. L. Perry, a National Guardsman, and Wesley Hills of Lake City disregarded warnings of continuing danger on Lake Pepin, hopped into a four-seat rowboat, and began the long pull toward Central Point. Other Lake Cityans, in as many as a dozen boats, began to follow. Once on the scene, these stout-hearted rescuers combined to save a handful of passengers and crew it soon became clear that only the drowned remained in the lake. Beginning at midnight on the 14th, National Guardsmen had cut through the Sea Wing's cabin roof, carefully removing victims one by one. They used the Ethel Howard, a Lake City-based steamboat, as a base of operation. The somber work yielded 52 bodies within two hours. Boatmen then rowed the dead ashore, placing them on the beach in a long line. At first light, the steamer Menominee towed the wreckage of the Sea Wing into shallower waters, where the guardsmen could continue to clear the ship's cabin of bodies. A calm, placid Lake Pepin greeted the dawn of Monday, July 14th. The natural beauty of the lake and the river bluffs that had captivated centuries of admirers was restored. Down trees, along with the wreckage of the sea wing off Central Point, provided the only evidence of Sunday evening's grim events. National Guardsmen, now in charge at the accident site, continued working to recover drowned victims on the largely submerged paddle wheeler, while the nearby shoreline bustled with activity. At about 11 a.m., Soldiers made a new hole near the pilot house, bringing a dress into view. After a momentary silence, one of the men stooped over and pulled on the garment until the body was freed. A guardsman lifted a young female into his arms, carefully arranged clothing to cover the legs, and then laid the victim in a waiting rowboat. He placed part of the ship's flag over her face. The body proved to be that of Bertha Winter, the 13-year-old daughter of John and Dorothea Winter of Red Wing. Before the skiff could move Winter to shore, searchers discovered drowned Alice Palmer adrift in the wreckage near the pilot house. Witnesses surmised that Winter and Palmer were together when the ship capsized. They drowned trying to get out of the front cabin door. Guardsmen attached a rope to Palmer's leg and pulled her body free. Hers was the 60th recovered. They also found the floating remains of an unidentified man. A foot had been caught on the cabin ceiling, leaving him hanging from that spot. His watch had stopped at 8.30. The drowned man was Fred Seavers, a Red Wing blacksmith. His son George had survived the wreck. Soldiers removed the victim through a hole in the deck and then brought it ashore. Family and friends of those aboard the Sea Wing had gathered at Central Point by morning. They waited in anguish to discover the fate of their loved ones. The storm had cut telegraph communication with Lake City, prolonging the agony of those upriver waiting for news. Red Wing officials sent a special train to Lake City, while another train from Lake City carried a few Sea Wing survivors home. They brought some news of what had happened to Red Wing, but little about individuals. Captain Weathern observed the work at Central Point. He had learned his eldest son, Roy, survived the wreck, but that his wife and eight-year-old boy were missing. Their bodies were recovered later in the day. 
Important chapters in the Sea Wing's tragic story now painfully played out. Steamer Ethel Howard's Monday morning arrival at the Red Wing levee brought the magnitude of the disaster into stark focus. It was a piteous sight, wrote a reporter, to see fathers, mothers, husbands, wives, brothers, and sisters assembled on the beach as they eagerly scanned the swollen and discolored faces. The bodies of Maria and Peter Gherkin and four of their five children were among the first 52 victims. Searchers later discovered their oldest son at the accident scene. Guardsmen found John and Kate Scheffler and their two sons in the cabin. Kate still held their infant son Frederick in her arms. No one had had the heart to separate them. Coroner John E. Kylo took charge of the bodies, ordering them to be taken to the undertaking rooms of A.H. Allen and Matthias Kaiser. Charlie Brown, who owned a local dray line, sent Teamsters Oli Oski and Carl Oscar Anderson to the levee, where they would collect the dead. They each drove a horse-pulled stone boat, their cargo platform covered with horse blankets. These low-slung transports, with the bed platform just six to eight inches off the ground, were used in local quarrying operations. Once at the levee, Oski and Anderson, assisted by volunteers, moved the bodies onto the wagons. The Red Wing Teamsters steeled their own emotions as mourners cried out in grief. The men knew a number of the drowning victims they carried. As Oski guided his wagon up toward Main Street, he worried about his son Oren. The 17-year-old had been a passenger on the Sea Wing and was still missing. Just how many had died in the accident remained open to question on Monday morning. The growing crowd gathered at Central Point held hope that loved ones might somehow be alive, but expected the worst. Officials labored to compile a list of survivors and of the dead, but it was still far from complete. By 10, National Guard Adjutant General John H. Mullen, in charge at Central Point, had done the math. An estimated 200 people had been on board the Sea Wing, Approximately 100 were safe, and 70 bodies had been recovered. About 30 victims remained in the lake. Newspaper reporters also hurried to Central Point. The Sea Wing disaster was a major story, and journalists hastened to get word of the tragedy to concerned readers across the nation. They planned to press Adjutant General Mullen for the latest accident information and also ready reports about recovery operations. Using sensational newspaper headlines, typical of the day, news editors attempted to capture the extent of the calamity in a few words. The tornado on Pepin's treacherous bosom, the crowning calamity of all Minnesota annals. A voyage of pleasure that ended on the shores of another world. 50 miles of river line plunged into the bloom of mourning for the fearful death of loved ones lost. A St. Paul Pioneer Press reporter and some colleagues took a carriage to Central Point Monday morning. As they hurried to the accident scene, horses at a gallop, a woman running along the road dashed in front of the carriage, forcing it to stop. She yelled that one of the reporters should give her his place in the carriage. The men's explanation that they were on business did little to impress her. The reporter drove the team out into the water and around the woman. She screamed as they moved past, you miserable wretches, you haven't any little boy in that lake. Mullen believed firing cannon shot into the water might create a disturbance that would bring bodies to the surface. He ordered Battery A to Central Point, shown here at Camp Lakeview, and at 11 a.m., the guardsmen unlimbered two cannon and commenced fire. As each volley echoed through the river valley, onlookers surged toward the water looking for victims. They found none. The uncle of Eliza Crawford, a Sea Wing victim, wrote this to her family back in Ohio. Eliza is among the missing ones and has not yet been found. I was up all night and today and have not yet as been able to find her. 
I entertain no hopes whatever of her safety. I have deferred to telegraph you in hopes that she might be found. She may be found soon, and it may be many days yet. We are nearly overcome with grief and fatigue. There are whole families lost. As far as known, there were only five females saved. There is mourning in Red Wing as nearly all were from there. God only knows the sorrow it has and will cause. We mourn not as those who have no hope. Liza was a good girl and has made many friends in so short a time. You do not know what a painful task this is. Such a disaster has never befallen this country. May God help you to bear up is my sincere prayer. Dragging operations conducted by the Lake Cityans came next, but the work proved futile. Mullen ordered 150 pounds of dynamite, planning to drop charges into the water on Tuesday. By evening, guardsmen stood watch along the shoreline, alert for surfacing bodies. The disaster at Lake Pepin paralyzed the city of Red Wing. At least 50 of its residents were known to be dead, a toll certain to rise. The community plunged into mourning. All business operations closed. Matthias Kaiser, owner of the Red Wing Furniture Company, and his five sons began four days of almost non-stop activity, preparing bodies for burial and building coffins. Red Wing endured a Tuesday filled with funerals. 44 were to be interred. In most cases, the victims were first placed in the family home for visitations. Mary Leach paid respects to her sewing school friend, Minnie Fisher. The teenager's body lay on two boards and bore a large gash across the forehead. Remains of the Steiger sisters, Annie and Frances, were brought to their aunt's house in Red Wing for reviewal. Red Wing blacksmith Fred Seavers and 13-year-old Bertha Winter had been among the first victims taken from the ship on Monday morning and were ready for burial by late Tuesday. Church bells began tolling in Red Wing at 9 o'clock Tuesday morning. Throughout the day, the city's three hearses, reinforced by a variety of wagons, carried Sea Wing victims to the town's three cemeteries. Mourners grieved in full knowledge that more funerals were to follow. About 25 townspeople were missing and presumed dead. The smaller Wisconsin communities of Trenton and Diamond Bluff were hard hit, with a combined death total of 18. Just past midnight on Wednesday morning, Lake Pepin began giving up its dead. National Guard soldiers reported bodies floating in the shallow warm waters near Central Point. Crews rowed out to the scene, tethered the bodies to the back of their boats, and brought them ashore. Remains were placed in coffins and ice added before being shipped to Red Wing. Decomposition of the bodies made identification difficult, but family members of the missing were on hand to assist. Diamond Bluff's Susan Miro, whose husband Roderick had just been found, had suffered through three days of unrelenting tragedy. Daughter Myrtle, 14, was among the drowned recovered on Monday. Lightning from the Sunday storm also struck the Miro barn, killing 11 horses. The family's 19-year-old son Austin, last seen clinging to the wreckage, was still missing. Harry Miro, a son of Susan and Roderick, learned of the family's loss through a telegram sent by his brother Fred. Come home at once. Your father, Myrtle, and Austin are all drowned. School teacher Eliza Crawford was found. So was Julia Persig, who could only be identified by the clothes she wore. The body of her sister Anna had been discovered on the first day. An inscription on a gold ring cut from the finger of a victim helped identify 30-year-old Peter Olson of Red Wing. Victims Fred Hadamer and Annie Schneider, engaged to be married, 
were buried side by side in Red Wing's St. John's Lutheran Church Cemetery. Crawford's uncle, H.W. Keller, from nearby Hay Creek, wrote to his niece's family in Ohio. He told of the gruesome challenge facing those charged with identifying the distorted human remains. Eliza was not recognizable. Her dress that she was drowned in was left on for it could not be taken off. Also, her shoes were left on. They might have been taken off. Her earrings were left in and I think one finger ring. The hat which she wore on the excursion we found and will send. Gustavus A. Carlson, Red Wing's acting mayor, led a delegation of city officials who kept vigil at Central Point. Carlson, a leading Red Wing businessman, held a personal interest in the recovery operations. His 21-year-old son Joseph had been on the Sea Wing and was still missing. Joe Carlson's body was the 32nd and last found on Wednesday. Local and regional newspapers fill their columns with news and guesswork about the accident. Rumors accusing the captain and crew of being drunk at the time of the accident circulated freely. A St. Paul newspaper editorial headed Man at Fault joined a chorus of critics accusing Captain Weatherin of incompetence. A rumor in print claimed officials in Ellsworth, Wisconsin were holding the captain in jail. Editors of the Lake City Graphic Journal and Red Wing Daily Republican, meanwhile, took care to avoid sensationalism. They called for calm and patience. Weathern and his crew received strong, even hateful criticism in Red Wing. The loss of his wife and son in the accident mitigated what most came to agree were the captain's lapses of judgment. It also became clear that none of the crew had been drunk or were even drinkers. Federal steamboat inspectors arrived in Minnesota on July 16th and began an accident investigation while bodies were still being recovered at Lake Pepin. After a week of hearings and study, the investigators found Captain Weathern had erred in starting out in the face of a storm, had overloaded the sea wing, and lacked proper certification for conducting such a voyage. On Friday, July 25th, Red Wing held a memorial program in the city park, today's Central Park, for those lost on the Sea Wing. Delegations from Lake City, Rochester, and St. Paul, along with mourners from other river cities and nearby towns, joined with Red Wing residents for the service. The Lake City group carried a handsome floral tribute with them. Red Wing newspapers estimated the crowd conservatively at more than 5,000. The disaster and its aftermath forged close ties between Red Wing and Lake City. It had been heroic Lake City men who were the first to row out onto the stormy lake and who later spent long hours helping with the search efforts. Mayor George Stout and other Lake City leaders had rushed to the Washington Street Landing to organize the rescue. At the urging of City Attorney Wesley Kenney, Lake City's Common Council issued orders that none of the costs from the later salvage efforts would be permitted to be sent to Red Wing. Now Stout and Kenney led the Lake City delegation to the memorial service. Goodyear County Attorney Frank Wilson expressed the feelings of Red Wing's citizenry regarding the terrible accident. This city has in the deepest gloom and in unutterable sorrow buried its dead. When the unspeakable grief of the afflicted, the awful pall of grief and mourning that enveloped us all, our thoughts and all of our actions were to relieve the suffering, comfort the brokenhearted, and tenderly lay away to rest our dead. Wilson also read from a Red Wing City Council resolution thanking those who assisted in the rescue and salvage work. Among those receiving special praise were Mayor George Stout and the men and women of Lake City. The thank you final words were clearly heartfelt. Language is too poor to express the deep sense of gratitude we feel. And the citizens of Red Wing 
with one accord, heartily join in saying, God bless you for your kind hearts and noble, self-sacrificing labors. A Red Wing photographer, J.D. Kellogg, constructed this collage using images provided by the victims' families. The Sea Wing disaster resulted in 98 deaths. In their final report, accident investigators found that about 215 people were on board when the steamer rolled. The toll among women and young female passengers was shocking. 50 of the 57 had been killed. Ship co-owner David Weathern returned to Diamond Bluff and resumed life as a merchant and steamboat owner. The captain was not prosecuted for his part in the Sea Wing disaster and, in fact, later rebuilt and operated the vessel until 1902. Captain Weathern stayed active as a Diamond Bluff businessman and civic leader until moving upriver to Prescott, Wisconsin in retirement. He died at age 75 in April 1929. Roy Weathern, David and Nellie's eldest son, survived the terrible events of July 13, 1890 and became a well-known and respected Mississippi Riverboat pilot. Roy later mused about the accident and its devastating effect upon his father. He returned to the river, said Roy Weathern, but it was years before I saw him smile again.
Und da 